Hello and welcome after the break. Um, I just want to say that the girl I will talk right now, I've met her on the Head Start, which was another awesome event organized by the House of Indy who are organizing this festival. And I was freaking amazed by the fact that she's so young and she's making a game every month and she's actually doing it. She's proving that it's possible. So please give a warm wel welcome to Vida Plankit. <laughs> So, uh, hey guys, uh, I guess you must have realized that my talk will be about one game a month. And I'll also talk about some tools that I use that you might find useful for rapid prototyping and so on. So, uh, this is the unofficial slogan of one game a month, is make games, not excuses. And so, for those that don't know, is this online challenge slash bootcamp thing where you try to make one small experiment every month. And you, you don't have to force yourself, like if you have a day job and so on, you can just make a small game in three hours, but that still counts. What really matters is that you kind of get yourself into the habit of like creating and getting yourself to like generate ideas and brainstorm and so on throughout the months to really make it a habit. And yeah, I used to never finish anything. So if we jump two years back, so before I made games, I would have this idea for like, like an MMO, but it was like kind of FPS, and it was like obviously better than anything else you've ever seen. But like I didn't have no skill, and uh, I, I'm not a coder or, any, or anything, so I didn't know how to make it. And I would just get an idea and then work on it for a few weeks, get disappointed, and just you know give up, obviously. But then something happened. Th this, this, this was my first game. It was actually before I started one game a month. Uh, there was the Flappy Jam, and this was a jam, you know, related to Flappy Bird. And what happened is that this guy on Twitter was like, oh, you should just use Construct 2. It's super easy to make games in it, and there's a preset for, like, this kind of, like, endless runner Flappy Bird thing. So you should just make something real fast for the game jam. And I was like, okay, it seems like there's no real pressure to make anything amazing. I'll just, like, you know, do it. And I just did it, and I posted it online, and it was there. It was was kind of crap, but I mean, it, it, it worked. Like it was something that I had produced and it was finished in a way. And that was like the core of One Game a Month is about making anything rather than making the next big thing. Like y in a month, you won't create anything amazing. You might have a great idea. It might turn up into something amazing. Like there's lots of jam games that turn up and end up being like great ideas. But for me, I like to make the metaphor of like painting because uh, you know artists keep sketchbooks and so on. And s what do sketchbooks have? They have lots of things, doodles, notes and so on. And they're not meant to be perfect or anything. They're just meant to like explore their ideas and so on. It, it's all about practice. And that's what one game a month is really about. And yeah, the doodles might not be great, but it's not about the results. It's about your training, the training you gain and so on. And uh, most importantly, it's about getting a feel for what works and what doesn't work because you might like, start making a game at some point and because you've had all this experience w with one game a month and you saw how people react to different projects, you kind of know what's gonna work and what kind of gameplay things you should use and so on because you've got so much small experiences that end up like giving you quite a tool set. And again, this relates to October. For those that don't know, it's like in October, you try to doodle for every day during the 31 days of uh, October, and it's supposed to just be practice in the same way that one game a month is. Well, okay, I wanted to make a point with this slide, but I just looked at the title, and it was Stock Photo, a young man joyously throws his hands up in the air, includes the clipping path. And I, ju I just, it just looks silly, so I put it in. Um, and. Well, these are like some examples of the games I made just to show you that like you can really explore anything. The first one is um, a game with no visuals in which you are a robot visiting a close friend. Uh, the second one, Horizon, is a game where you explore my room and with the different objects within it through audio cues. And the last one is a game about a sushi place that sells gender roles. Gen roles. Yeah, as you can see, the quality of the games varies throughout the months, but like, it, it was still great fun to do, like, random MS Paint art, just as it was, like, exploring Unity and so on. So, of course, I could tell you about, like, a top 10 list of the things I learned, but really, you learn the best when you, like, you do it yourself. So, uh, what I'll do next is just walk you through a few tools and stuff you can use to 
make games not only for like people who want tools of rapid prototyping, but also people who are not coders at all. So on the left, we have Construct 2. Um, I really like Construct 2, and I'm really annoyed at Game Maker, not because it's bad, but because people always advise others to use Game Maker. But Construct is just as good, and I, I find it even more visual and easy to use. You have these behaviors, so you can have like a, a platform behavior, a solid behavior that you add to objects, and it just works. And uh, you can also expand it with a JavaScript SDK, so it also has some like programming things if you're into that. And on the right, we have Twine. It's for text-based games. It's also like in 30 minutes you can like learn most of it, and it, you use notes to, notes to connect things and so on. And it's it's really nice to use, and it can also be used, for example, if you're writing a more na narrative-based game to like prototype the story. I think some people do that. And audio-wise, on the left you have BFXR. Oh yeah, by the way, all all four of these are like free, so that's cool. And on the left you have BFXR. It's used for sound effects. There's lots of variety, you, as you can see, lots of knobs and presets and stuff. On the right is Bosque Seol, which was made by the guy who made Super Hexagon. It's also super easy to use. You can make chiptune music with it really easily. Then you have this, IndieGameJams.com. Uh, as you can see, there's like 15 things going on at the same time. So if you feel like you want to start one game a month, but you don't have a theme, like you don't really know what you're doing, or you want like to have 48 hours to do something rather than the full month, instead of having to mull over it, you can just go on IndieGameJams.com. There's like online jams going on all the time, and you can find themes that you're into. Like there's Man versus Weather, Sugar, Sugar Sweets Jam, and so on, like Doom Jam, like really a huge variety of things. Itch.io, which is amazing. I just love Itch.io. It's basically a platform which you can use to put your games on completely for free. It supports Unity games, Twine games, anything downloads. People even use it for comics and so on. And you just throw it on there. And as you can see, you have like a pug there. And it's a game called Hot Dates, where you actually date pugs. So you, you have like really random games there. And you can really find a community there and you can talk with people and so on. They've recently launched their forum. And one last thing before I go, I wanted to show you a screenshot of the landing page for my blog. So that's that. Follow that advice, please. Thank you. I didn't know that was. What do you I want? What do you want in the background? Something nice. You've got a nice picture. It's, it's pretty well, nice. Yeah, let's have that. Yeah. You got some water. Hello. Hello. So you might recognize me from introducing the uh, talks over the past couple of days. Uh, my name's Pat. I'm a producer and a curator, and I'm a bit too tall to stand there, so I might move. Uh, hang on, let me get my notes up. So I'm here to talk really quickly about zines. Here's some props. Didn't get a presentation, but I got props. I'm going to stop standing in front of stuff that makes it go woo. So I... I this isn't just an advert for these zines, but I do have these zines for sale. <laughs> Why not come and buy one after the talk? <laughs> so yeah, uh, like I've made some zines, some of those are my housemates, uh, but I have a large-ish, not that huge, collection of zines related to games. Uh, and I think zines are really important, and they give us an insight into the like personal histories of video games, like the waves and the movements that make up the huge scene that is video games, and they are like they're, they're as old as games themselves. The old zines themselves are older, but zines about games have been around since like games came around, like stuff like Two Six Hundred Connection, which is like a Atari newsletter, which ran for like ten years or something. Like little things like Journey's End and Roll Call, which is an RPG about role playing games, a clever name. 
and like hundreds of other ones that were made, sold like five copies, someone poured their heart into. Like there have been waves of zines, like things coming and going. There was a big thing around the late 2000s, which like a lot of Americans were making zines and that kind of faded. Stuff like exp.zine, One Up Magazine, various other ones, but it feels to me like we're on a like kind of rising crest of another wave of zines at the moment. And yeah, these are the histories of like the ground floor of games. These are not the things told to us in magazines or in glossy adverts. They're not about, <coughs> on the whole, like I'm sure there probably is a Call of Duty zine, but not about things like Call of Duty. And like, re they're really amazing historically. Like I recently got a copy of the One Up magazine issue three from like 2005 and it's it's really interesting because you can see in it the kind of beginnings of the formation of what kind of became the indie boom of 2008 and it's talking about moving away from that kind of weird stagnated e free vibe that was really big in those years and still is but hey uh, <laughs> But yeah, not only are zines themselves important in documenting experimental work and talking about work that isn't getting talked about, but themselves are like experimental for the creators. So you have like writers trying out stuff in zines they want for like their commercial work, or you have stuff like uh, there was a magazine in the 80s in the UK uh, about the ZX Spectrum, which was called 16 slash 48, which was released on tape. And you just bought a tape and it had all like columns on it and stuff. And you had like stuff like the disc mags that the demo scene was making. And like, for an example, it's really rambling, sorry. It's clearly inspired by David's talk earlier. Uh, do you want to see some dogs? Uh, so, yeah, like, for example, the demo scene is a huge thing and totally underwritten about, in my opinion, and people should pay more attention to it. I'm standing in front of the project, uh, but like the history is a fact, like I was recently reading a book about it and all the history is based on oral histories and articles written in the disc mags of the time. And without those, like that entire vast swathe of like computer art would just be missing. And it's really important that people are making zines and documenting on the ground level, like, the scenes that we have. So basically, take away, uh, write zines, write your own histories down, because if you don't, no one else will. Uh, and your experiences of games and art and all that will be lost. And also, because I want to give you some money for your zines, because I like zines. And it's pronounced zine, not zine. Listen to Kanye West, he's true. <laughs> It costs about uh, that much rupees, which is about five dollars. But no, uh, it's uh, it's still pretty expensive. Um, and there was uh, what that meant. If is, I took this money and put it in the bank at ten percent annual interest, I would get that much money every month, uh, every year, and I could live off it for the rest 
my life. So I was like, okay, I really don't think I'm gonna spend that much money on studying computer games. And uh, I decided to uh, work for studios in India as a game designer. I did that for a few years till I realized that nobody was making games of their own. It was all Bollywood cricket games or poker games, like Indian poker games. And it was really boring for me and I got super frustrated. And then I started Yellow Monkey. And uh, we were, uh, we started working on our own games and that's when I was like, okay, this could be my big chance to go to the US. I'm gonna make something really awesome and take it to GDC. And I think that was kind of my first mistake. Like I, I, I feel that as a developer, I was always placing this too much importance on GDC. Like, oh my God, it's gonna change my life and it's gonna be this amazing experience. And I was always too self-critical of my own games. Like, oh, this is not good enough to take to GDC. This is not good enough. Uh, I've made uh, a couple of games that did okay for us. Uh, first one was Hubrix, which is uh, about dragging paths to fill spaces uh, in a grid. And uh, <clears throat> then we did um, around when we did uh, Hubrix was the first time I felt like I yes I should I should go to GDC. And um, I uh, was that time at an accelerator in Estonia for three months and. Uh, from there, I applied to um, a US visa for a demo day, and it was really interesting because they told me that I, I couldn't get a US visa because I wasn't applying from my home country. And But it was really strange because the form clearly had an option. Are you applying from your home country? No. Well, if I tick no, then just don't let me apply for a visa. <laughs> I wasted 150 euros on that and then uh, I went uh, back to the incubator and told them that this happened and they said like great one of the founders of the incubator was also someone who uh, knew the US ambassador to Estonia super well and he was like oh don't worry about it just apply again I'll tell him and he'll make sure you'll get it and I was like okay 150 euros more in uh, go back for the interview and the guy there's a different guy interviewing you because they don't want to be biased and then they were like, okay, uh, great, you're applying again, but, um, and we've got a really nice recommendation from the ambassador, but we still can't give it to you because it's a policy issue. It's like, okay, and I went back and I just learned that another friend of mine who was also Indian and a classmate of mine got a US visa from Chile, so I don't know what that was about. Uh, anyway, uh, couldn't go that year, um, and uh, then we released another game called Sky Sutra, which is also a puzzle game and uh, this time also I tried to go and I finally got my US visa this time. Um, this is the game I'm working on right now by the way it's a local multiplayer game about flying carpets. Um, I saved up a lot of money when uh, we made Sky Sutra about that much which is uh, about seven and a half thousand dollars and I finally got my visa and decided to go to GDC <coughs> and um, I was going to Amsterdam to show the game at another conference and sadly my bag was stolen and it had my passport, my two laptops, my two tablets, pretty much my whole office and I was absolutely devastated. Uh, depressed, I went back and uh, I was like, it doesn't matter now, even if I have a game or not, this year I'm going to go to the GDC and finally, last year, I did do that and it was uh, fun but I think I, I still think that I uh, gave too much importance to it. I built it up too much in my head, but it was still so much fun. And I look forward to going again this year now that I have a visa. That's uh, my journey to the GDC. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, 45 minute talk condensed into six, so papers. Yep. Hi, my name is Shalev. I'm a games curator and game designer from Tel Aviv. Uh, I want to talk today about an idea I had uh, a couple of years ago about a possible future uh, for documentary games. Uh, and actually, since I first gave that talk in 2014, this topic became even harder than it, hotter than it was back then mainly because of this. 
So if you've been following what's uh, been done with uh, VR lately, uh, a lot of efforts are being made uh, towards creating immersive documentaries in virtual reality. But today I don't want to talk about the means of experiencing these works, but rather about the means of producing them. So you can roughly divide uh, the building blocks of documentary or a, a journalistic report into two groups. The one is uh, testimony. So uh, testimonies are reports by people who tell you what they witnessed or what they understand that happened, right? And the other group is documents. So documents are recorded materials uh, like photos, sounds, uh, video recordings that are captured mechanically straight from the scene being reported. Now, uh, documentaries in broadcast media, like uh, film, television, uh, papers, radio, rely heavily on documents that are native to them, uh, right? So they have, like I said, uh, sound recordings, video recordings, photos. Even when the, th those kind of media are using uh, a lot of testimonies, especially like in radio and newspapers, reports are frequently grounded with documents. Now, documentaries in interactive media today are based on testimonies, usually. When you're uh, trying to, uh, to talk about reality, uh, games usually reenact events acting as testimony. So in uh, a game like 11-bit uh, uh, studios, This War of Mine, uh, players engage with the system heavily inspired by testimonies from the Bosnian War. Or uh, in Lucas Pope's Papers, Please, which is uh, not documentary, but a game that kind of talks with reality. The players engage with a system made to imitate the author's experience moving between countries and borders and alludes to the realities of life behind the Iron Curtain, but none of it is really referential. Not that there's anything wrong with that. The photo you see here is uh, uh, a page from The Spectator. Uh, the Spectator was uh, what... Uh, 400 years ago, one of the first examples of modern journalism, uh, it was what you call literary journalism. So writers wrote in the voice of fictional characters, and they were telling stories that were more like a caricature, but were used to report real events. So uh, when game creators today are trying to use traditional documents in documentary-ish works, um, so uh, sorry. When, when game creators today are trying uh, uh, to do documentary -ish works, they're using traditional documents that are from the broadcast media side, like photos and videos. So in uh, That Dragon Cancer, for example, uh, the author incorporates recordings, real recordings of his son, which is the subject of the game, of his son's voice in the game that is uh, otherwise fictional. Or uh, in a, a famous interactive uh, uh, documentary like uh, Prison Valley, Users navigate a system uh, that contains videos uh, of the place being documented. But these materials, videos, uh, sound recordings, photos, uh, are native to traditional broadcast media, to linear media, not to interactive media. So that is why I want to talk right now about uh, three evolving forms of data technology. They, they exist, they are evolving right now, that may very soon become principal tools uh, in the creation of documentary games. This is probably my most techno-optimistic talk. So the first uh, tool or data form is 3D imaging. The photo you're seeing here is uh, that nice family was taken by uh, the first gener generation of Kinect, I think. But current 3D imaging is much more advanced. So what we're seeing here, from, it's a capture from, I think, uh, two years ago. That's a, that's a house fully captured with uh, Google's um, Project Tango device. And this, and this technology works with Unity. So uh, imagine, for example, the makers of Gone Home, which is a fairly realistic game, capturing, capturing their own lived environment instead of fabricating one. So that's one idea of how new data technologies can uh, inspire documentary works. The second form is real-time data and big data. Uh, so uh, think, think of a creation like this. This is a capture from Bear 71. It's a Canadian documentary. It's an interactive documentary about the effects that city expansion has on wildlife. And the way you consume it, it's shown uh, like a real-time map of a reserve 
where you can see the movements of people and animals that are derived from actual tracking devices and cameras spread around the reserve, and you see it in real time. So imagine something like this used in a game like Metrico, a game that, uh, where the game space topography is actually affected and responds to data generated by the player. So what if, instead of responding to the data that the player is producing, it would respond to uh, real life uh, data, to data generated uh, and taken from the world? What if Metrico was, in, was affected by, I don't know, market changes? When the market collapses, the land collapses. Think of stuff like that. And finally, in the crossroads between the two first forms, the last form I want to talk about is mapping. So uh, we're getting really, really good at mapping the world with really, really high detail. This is uh, a photo from a project called Reroll. Uh, it's an action RPG game set in real world environments. What the creators did when they pitched the game, sorry, uh, they used drones to 3D scan large areas in the world and turn them into game levels. So this mountain is a real mountain captured in 3D. But uh, there's actually a large scale documentary uh, mapping project that, that exists for years. For what is Google Street View, if not a huge documentary walking simulator? Now, uh, the reason I'm excited for this uh, is that there's a huge potential here to tell stories that were never told before by documentarists. Uh, as we all know, broadcast media and old media is uh, linear. And so it's really good for telling histories, a series of events. But documentary games can depict systems. They can report situations as they are. And that might have a profound impact on, on how audiences perceive the world and the kind of knowledge they learn from documentary works. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, I'm Igor Sandman. I'm a game developer and pixel artist. Uh, I'm here today to talk about something that's happening in my hometown, Liège. Uh, something is moving right now. Uh, you know, in most cities, uh, there are people working in the game industry, in the game, in the game culture in general, but in various aspects of it. Like someone might be studying games as a medium at the university, or another one might be working in a game studio. Uh, but we all disconnected often. And uh, recently, one of us in Liège decided that we should try to do something together. So uh, we, are, we are building a collective very soon that is going to focus on bringing us together and try to do things together. Uh, the, 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 the benefits of doing this would be that uh, first, we could get, we, one of us could um, create an event about his side of video games, and the others would help. And the others would help because they know that when they want to do an event themselves, somebody will help. Also, we can share funding because if we go to the politicians and uh, ask for funding, if we all go separate ways, it won't work. They, to, uh, to them, we all the same with video, video games. So uh, we also can bring, together, bring everyone together to create an event that is uh, showing uh, different sides of the video games into one single event. So uh, next month, in March, we are going to create uh, Les Interactifs Associés, which means uh, in, uh, Interactive Associates. Uh, so uh, the, the main goal, so among us, we have many uh, different people working in different areas. We have people working at the university. Uh, they are uh, at, actually in the University of Liège, we have very, uh, since very recently, we have uh, cursus that is uh, happening once a week, and that is free. And uh, we are incorporating that cursus into the, the, the collective. And uh, also we have, like you, some of you might know, we have a meetup group uh, called L'Apero, which is like, uh, like House of Indies uh, making he here uh, uh, the Indie Game Salon, or the Brotaru in Brussels. It's the same kind of thing. 
uh, we are also incorporated, incorporating that into uh, the collective. So the reason why we're doing that is so we can put the name of the collective everywhere. everywhere. So every time there's an event on video games around Liège for now, uh, we will have our name on it and it will create a, so, some, soft, uh, some sort of activity for the group. Uh, but we're also working on new things. Like uh, one of us uh, just bought the, the eSport bar in Liège from the franchise uh, uh, Meltdown. But we are dropping the title. We are making our own thing because it wasn't a good experience. So s very soon, like actually they are inaugurating next, next week. So we will have a, a great eSport bar over there with uh, uh, f fighting game tournaments. Uh, you can also rent the place to to uh, create a, an event. We will have a theme party and so on. So it's not exactly us, but we will put our flag on it because he's part of the association. The guy also owns a video game store, so he knows the thing. Um, our main event actually will be, uh, we are aiming to create a, a festival, probably by the end of this year, hopefully. Uh, it will be an event that will be representative of the collective, so it will have many sides to it. It won't be like this event, it will be very different. Uh, we will have um, a fighting game tournament during the event, so there's a side of gaming for gamers. We will have uh, an indie game showcase like they have here. Uh, we will also have talks uh, for uh, from the university, they are organizing it. Uh, also, uh, 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 a pawn shop for retro gaming and a small uh, uh, showcase for artists around video games, like making uh, t-shirts and, and everything. So this event is hopefully happening uh, at the end of this year, if we can manage to do it. Uh, and you are invited, of course. And we will start uh, talking about it very soon. Right now, it's only, only work in progress. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, yeah, to the, the existing event organizer, we are not competition, of course, we are uh, allies, and we hope we can reach out to you very soon to make things together here in Belgium. So thank you. So, hi, my name is Stéphane Hero, but uh, since it's a French complicated name and that even French people can't seem to pronounce it right, you can call me Q, like my Twitter handle. Um, I'm still a student, but I'm part of the French collective called Clonodike. Uh, we have a room upstairs in the head of us, so if you haven't checked our games, you should check them out or on our website. Um, and so, what I'm going to talk about is that um, Bram asked me, like, uh, Wednesday, if I wanted to like make a micro talk for like five or ten minutes and I was like oh yeah super cool it's gonna be great and I had an idea for it and at 3 a.m. I was no this is shit it doesn't work um, I was completely freaking out and uh, I got super scared and I couldn't sleep and it was horrible so instead of that I'm gonna talk about fear uh, so fear is something that is always I've always, always been fascinated by um, and it's also something I always try to get rid of um, by fascinating, I mean that I love being scared in a way. Uh, I've been into horror games, horror movies, horror literature for a while. Uh, it's a genre I seriously enjoy as a whole. But I'm very picky on the subject because um, I'm not especially fond of uh, horror movies that are about like horrifying people, as in disgusting them with blood and guts and zombies and everything, but more as uh, terrifying uh, movies and games, as in super, super scary. Um, yeah, so I don't really care for zombie or slasher movies because, yeah, they're kind of boring all the same, in a way. <laughs> but I'm really fond of, like, ghost and exorcism movies. Uh, so why is it so? I think it's mostly because it involves uh, supernatural, paranormal, and most of the time, invisible forces uh, that supposedly don't and shouldn't exist uh, in the first place. So when they show themselves through one way or another, like uh, poltergeist or possessing children or anything, uh, you can't compare it with something you know because you don't know what it is because it doesn't have any physical form. You're just afraid of something, yeah, that doesn't exist. Anyway, because you can't put a word on a, or a picture or a shape on it, I find it this way scarier than anything else in, you can find in horror. 
But it's okay, it's normal, because the fear of the unknown is something that is as old, old as mankind. <clears throat> and I think that's why I'm into horror. By watching a horror movie or playing a, ho <coughs> a horror game, I can allow myself to be legitimately scared of something, because that's the whole point of the thing. It's supposed to be made for that. And it's reassuring to know that it's okay to be scared, that it's normal to be scared of something you're supposed to be scared of. Because the truth is, I am scared all the time. I have all these small things that just that I worry about and I grow in my head and paralyze me in a way. Um, people tell me I shouldn't be scared, that I should relax and not think about it, but I can help it. I'm scared of a lot of things. I'm scared in planes and elevators. I'm scared of doing this talk right now and being in front of cameras. <laughs> I'm scared of all of you. <laughs> um, I'm scared that some people who know me will watch this later and make fun of me. I'm scared of what I'll be doing next year after I graduate. I'm scared of never getting, getting as good as the other people in my collective. I'm scared of being left behind, I'm scared of death, and all that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes, yeah, all these fears really paralyze me and uh, prevent me from doing things that I would usually enjoy, like drawing, making games, or even sleeping. And this is what I meant about my relationship with fear. I wish I could get rid of all these fears I ex experience on a daily basis, but at the same time, it's by scaring myself that I can't forget about them in a way. So I have no real idea of how I should deal with all this fear. Should I embrace my fears and accept them as part of me, or try to fight them and, um, yeah, become a better person? <laughs> um, for the moment, it's something that is here and that I have to live with, and I try, to, I try to use it the best way I can by creating things with it. So I'm going to talk about a few games I made. So this game is called uh, Your Darkest Fault. Uh, it's a very simple game. You just type all the things that are going through your head and they're going to disappear on screen. Uh, without leaving a trace behind, so it's just you can completely expose your thoughts to um, an interface and nobody is going to judge you or anything. <coughs> uh, yeah, it's meant to help you put words on your feelings and have some sort of dialogue between, well, some sort of yourself and another one, or with the void, and without having to worry about what other people are going to think about you. And this is born mostly out of my fear of um, <coughs> opening up to people I know. It's something I still struggle with a lot, and you're going to see this very soon. But thanks to the creation of this game, it's a bit easier now. And so currently, I'm working on this game called More. Uh, the point of the game is to feed apples to the mouth in front of you. But each time you do, it gets hungrier and wants more and wants more and wants more. And at some point, there's no more apples on the, on the table, and you have to feed it to your hand. Uh, through this game, I'm trying to illustrate how I'm scared of the way I interact with other people, with my friends and uh, how I depend on them, especially in love relationships. It may seem strange, but it's something I'm super, super self-conscious self about. Uh, I've shared almost nothing of this game yet, and it is the first time that I'm even mentioning the title or, or what it is about. Uh, but I've been actually working on it since uh, last June, and I've shared a few screens of it, but nobody knew what it was about. Because mostly, as you might have guessed, I'm super scared to talk about it. And that is the biggest problem with this process. Using your fears to fuel your creativity will definitely make you work on games that you can relate with and express yourself with. But at the same time, it is incredibly, incredibly personal. It feels like you're opening up to everybody in the world and giving people actually the sticks to hit you with and to hurt you with. <laughs> so it does take a lot of courage to start working or talking about it. Um, another disadvantage is that it takes a lot of time. I spend as much time working on, um, <clears throat> on the game as in worrying about what it's about because yeah, you have to make design choices that are related to uh, the faults you have, and so it's kind of hard. So I'm not really making a lot of progress. But the biggest advantage is that it helps you put words and images of what you're feeling. This way it's easier to understand what it's all about, and thus less scarier. Uh, like the opposite of a good horror movie. So in a way, by making these games, you could say I'm doing some sort of self-therapy. But I don't know yet if it's really gonna help me, or it's just me getting more and more stuck in my feelings. Hopefully you can also have people learn about how you feel, or how friends with similar issues feel. And I think it's also part of why I'm making this game, so I can connect better with other people, and find a way to open up to them. And in a way, I think that's also why I made this talk. I want to connect with people, but I'm so scared of talking about myself, that I actually use my fear of being here on this scene to talk about it about you. <laughs> uh, so these were basically all the things I wanted to talk about before we all leave. I just want to make sure you guys know that this is not the only way I make games. <laughs> and that, yes, I've worked on many other games that are way funnier and happier. Um, and yeah, this talk was just about the games I make mostly for myself, to understand myself and to express myself. But of course, I'm also making games just for the fun of making games or uh, for people to enjoy. 
Um, yeah, fear can drive the way I create things, but it shouldn't be my main inspiration, else it would be really sad and unhealthy. So that's it. <laughs> Right. Uh, we have two more hyper talks, um, but one is from somebody who couldn't be here because she is sick. But the next one um, is, please bear with me, a little bit of a technical uh, issue. Yeah, can I get the power? Um, let me let me call him up. Titi, Titi, sure. Sure. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm going to give a short introduction, but then you then you can take it away, yeah. man. Cool? Okay. Okay, so this is, this is, uh, <laughs> hey, nice. This is Titi Chumia from uh, Johannesburg. I met him at Amaze Johannesburg, and yeah, I, uh, we tried to get him here. I worked on this, or we both worked super hard on his getting his visa procedure, getting all the visa papers done to have it be delayed past his flight date. And that was an enormous bummer for both of us. Um, and I tried, I tried to find a way to get uh, TC included anyway. So he's going to he's gonna do a talk he did at the Major Hansburg for us now. And please, everybody, keep your fingers crossed that the internet connection will hold out. All right. All right, man. They're all yours. Hello. <laughs> How are you guys? Uh, wait. My name is Titi, and uh, I graduated from Institute for, for Game Design. And uh, yes, yeah, so, like I'm gonna put part on my honors for for the, the thing. I, I hope I hope you guys can see this. So I have a yeah. I have some slides. I hope you guys can see this. Uh, oh. uh, so yeah, so my, my, my talk is about like the perceived roles of small games in in, in in small South African in small South African communities, right? So like uh, a bit about me. <laughs> So I grew up in Limpopo, which is like a very rural township away from Johannesburg. And I moved to Johannesburg for, for university and school and stuff. And then I became a game designer, a uh, game design student and stuff. And then I sat down immediately after all that stuff. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, the purpose of my research was like to find out what the roles of games was and what people thought of games. Like especially because I chose Bajo movie because I grew up in the Bajo movie, and I wanted to find out what the people that lived there thought and think what the fun games were. Like I want to take into consideration. I want to take the the the, the, the oh cool. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn us off oh. because the, the connection is kind of bad. Okay. So what are you turning off? I'm gonna turn off our video. But just uh, just keep talking. Okay, cool. So I wanted to take in the the interesting perspective. Uh, of what like people thought games and, and and their function was in the community, so I wanted to take the different the differences and the similarities. So basically, I wanted to find out what the popular opinion of people of of people within the community thought games. I mean, like I to see the popular opinion of people. I mean, the popular people uh, the popular opinion of what people thought about games. The, in the community, so uh, like first I needed to look at how how the people played and stuff. So 
I realized like the most of the people in the, in the small townships they play like in groups so like they always play analog like analog type games in in groups and like they what they they chat the yeah yeah so they want to they want they want people to like play in groups so like they so like this picture yeah like a group of guys playing an ancient game called Muruba I I know like it has a, like a lot of different names but we call it Muruba and like on 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 Wikipedia, it has this thing where they say you must play it under a tree, uh, like a group of men play it under, and like there the, there's a tree there, so they're playing it under a tree, so they're playing it right. And then here is like a, a picture of like little girls and little boys playing a game called Chicago, and it's like a it's like a physical type game where you throw a ball and then you try to hit like tins in the middle. And stuff like that, and it, it's it's cool to see how they still play because in Joburg you wouldn't find things like these because Joburg is more like modernized and stuff like. And there's like a video of a group of men playing playing the game. I just I just I wasn't ready for this, so I didn't. Uh, okay, I didn't think it. So like, yes. Sideways. Oh, like that. No, actually, <laughs> actually, actually, that's worse. Never mind. Like that. <laughs> no, no. Never, never mind. Like that. Yeah, that's good. Sorry, man. No, uh, okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, like. I, I, I don't know why this video is not working, but yeah. So like I needed to look like the details, like so, of of like look at like some of the finer details, like so the that they play are rather intrusive and like and that's how the people like they they the games become a platform for other groups. Like, so they they want like a game to like a lot of people together and stuff like that. So they it makes it necessary for people to meet. This is what the people were saying. Them. They say like games make it necessary for people to meet, and like I think that's something that people cherish. Like the people from the town, they, they they cherish that a lot. That people must be together and ensure that a community stays a community. That's what what one gentleman said. And but what what interesting is that it's not just the arcades. I mean, it's just that's just analog games. It's like even the arcade. You see like this picture? It's like at the arcades. Like, a lot of kids come there, and some of them don't even have money. I spoke to a, a kid and I asked him, like, why does he come to the arcade? And he, he doesn't even have money, but he knows, like, his parents like when he's around kids and the kid and just playing and stuff. And kids are like, no, they, like, the parents feel very comfortable for their kids to be around those kind of areas and stuff like that, because they know, like, not a lot of bad stuff happens. Even even the shop owner was like he doesn't make a lot of money from it, but because of what like pivotal role that the thing hold, the, the the arcade holds in the community, then he wa he wants it like so like these are like some short stats about Lavajo. I'm gonna skip like it's a very young area. like it was uh, established in 1971. So meaning like, means that like everyone that lives there, especially the the elderly. They've been part of the history ever since it was created. So all the cultural aspects of that, it's like some people have seen it from the beginning, which is really, really, really interesting. So, uh, so like the kind of that was built by these people. So that's why it's really interesting, to get, like their perspective, right? So then I asked about like individualized play in terms of people playing on their phone and playstations and by themselves and stuff like that. And the people say they have like. But uh, the younger guys have like a love-hate relationship with it because they know that it's fun and all that, but they know that like the elderly will not appreciate it. So they are very like they love it, but they know they should hate it, but they still love it, you know. And the elderly know that it's kind of educational, like it, but and but like they 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 don't like it because of what it represents. It represents like the opposite culture, but they try. And so uh, what I've learned from the studies, like games that make it necessary for people to come together in townships, especially in the uh, what's this? It brings people 
together and teaches them important values about community. Like they were to, like they go into so much detail that I wish I could go to, but the scale uh, doesn't allow me to go into that. Then like games, uh, what's this? Uh, actors. This was interesting. The actors type of, as a between environment between like formal education and uh, and like informal education so like they know kids live certain aspects of of of, of, of like formalization play games but don't want it to be implemented into like uh schools and stuff like it because they think that it's a leisure time learning activity i, I don't know if that makes sense but yeah um and yeah that's my talk thank you so much Up, man. I'm gonna hang up now. Oh. It was, it was, good. It was good. We heard, uh, we heard everything. Maybe, um, maybe can you post some of the pictures on Twitter? Can you post some of the yeah. photographs from your thing on Twitter with hashtag ScreenShake16? Oh, okay, cool. Uh, some of the photos were hard to see, but if you could post some photos on Twitter with hashtag okay, cool. ScreenShake16. I'm gonna take a picture so like everyone like raise their hands up. He actually was trying to send me a video he recorded, but he, the internet connection where he was was too bad. That's why I was stressing so much for the last hour. But I'm glad it worked out. Um, we have one more HyperTalk. Uh, and then we're going to do something else that's really cool. Hey, Sherry, there. Okay. Hmm. Oh. Yes, it's on. Um, hello, screen shake people. How are you doing? Um, my name is Sherida, and instead of being with you in front of you, talking to you, um, I'm recording this micro talk here from my home because I'm sick and um, it's quite awkward my neighbor is next door kind of watching um, me through the window but um, I'm not gonna waste any more time I'm gonna get started so my talk is called lessons that Star Wars the Old Republic or any MMO for that matter may perhaps uh, could possibly be teaching me I think um, about about being healthy um, which is kind of stupid because I'm, I'm at home being sick but um, bear with me um, originally I wanted to give a talk about more about creativity but I thought this might be a little bit more important because a lot of people that I know um, that make games or, or do any kind of creative work um, we struggle kind of making a balance between uh, life um, and pleasure and, and the way that we approach our work uh, so people um, are stressed out or very busy and that's kind of like the optimal uh, settings and then on the other hand we people that completely burn out and struggle with their mental health um, luckily for me I'm more of the being incredibly stressed out all the time kind of um, part of the of the spectrum um, and a few weeks ago so I normally I don't play a lot of games um, but I started playing over the holidays um, Star Wars the Old Republic which is an MMO made by Bioware the stories you can play like either um, dark side light side and anywho it doesn't really matter um, but I was playing the game and I kind of realized that how similar my approach to playing an MMO is to my personality which is basically it's all kind of offense and, and no defense so I just barge in I always 
try to figure out how to do as much DPS as possible, damage as possible. I grudge in, I start hacking and slashing in a sort of fury of um, well, particle frenzy, <laughs> basically, and I start hitting things and I, I kind of select um, my, my, my skills based on you know the amount of damage they do, and I try to do as much as possible. Um, and then, so I go all in. Uh, and most of the time it works. Um, I just lose a lot of health and I you know, get out of a fight and then I heal some bit and I do the same thing all over again. Um, and then when I started playing with other people, because I, I started out doing an MMO by myself, but when I started playing with other people, they were kind of commenting on my playing style and kind of wondering why I wasn't um, using and managing my rotations. Um, for those of you that don't know MMOs, um, rotation is basically kind of a, um, a system of optimal, uh, optimized um, way to use your skills, um, taking into account their different cooldowns. So, for example, uh, the order in which you execute your attacks or, or skills, um, because a lot of them have a casting time and they have a time of cooling down before you can use them again. And for every sort of game MMO, you can make an optimal rotation and kind of make the best, basically, um, of what you can do uh, at a certain point. So, I started looking into that and I kind of realized that um, it was very similar to, to, to real life and I kind of, you know, what kind of lessons can I take from this? So, um, <laughs> so one of the things I realized I also do is sometimes I don't want to fight like the little monsters and I just want to keep going, so I keep running. But then, you know, you come into their, their area and they get activated and they, you get the little red dots on your minimap and they start following you around and you just keep outrunning them and at some point, you know, you get locked in a fight and then all those little bastards that you've been ignoring for the past five minutes also catch up with you and they start beating you senseless. So <laughs> at some point my avatar was laying down there um, being like defeated with a lot of low level monsters and I kind of realized like ah, this is actually very similar to, to what I do um, on a you know daily basis concerning my work and, and, and concerning my, my overall um, well, a way of life, basically. Um, so it was time for some optimization. Um, so I, I realized a couple of things. Is One of the things I realized is that a lot of people, especially in the West, we kind of tend to focus um, very high aspects of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I drew it down here somewhere. There is a pyramid here somewhere. Yes. No. Okay. So, basically, this is Maslow's hierarchy of need. At the bottom, you have your foundation, which is basically physiological needs. So you think about breathing, about food, about water, um, sex, sleep. And then you have your safety, you know, security of employment, um, safety of home, kind of that feeling. Then you have belonging, then you have esteem and self-actualization. Um, esteem, like feeling confident, being creative, those are on the top. And those are basically the ones that we kind of focus on when we talk about quality of life, right? We want to be, especially indie developers, we want to be able to um, express ourselves freely, we want to be able to make um, meaningful, awesome games, um, and we want to you know, harvest that creativity, um, which is good, but at the same time, we do it sometimes completely ignoring all those little bastard monsters, like, you know, um, eating regularly, exercising, um, staying, staying hydrated, um, you know, getting enough sleep, having you know a social kind of network that helps you and, and defines you. Um, so I'm <laughs> seeing my timer, and I'm starting to run out of time. But yeah, playing that game kind of helped me realize that in order to to be um, a good artist, to be a good game developer, to be a good person, and have like a meaningful, um, healthy, stable kind of life, we need to take some lessons from, from, from an MMO that I was playing. So basically, in conclusion, my lessons are find your rotation, find that optimal kind of assets that kind of takes the best of what you can and cannot do, and then, you know, like, make it in. Don't try to do too many things, but find your focus, find a rotation, find a routine that works for you. Um, you know, with food, um, schedule your food, schedule your drinks, schedule your... Your, your, your off time schedule, your creativity, I'm over time, I'm sorry. Um, 
take time between fights or projects to properly heal, reevaluate, and adjust your rotation. Um, playing with others is a lot more effective. You need a good support network. You need friends. You need people to, to, to back you up. You need, you need healers. You need tanks. You can't just run in there and, and just start hitting things. It works sometimes, but you know, it also can be quite lethal um, and also makes you really, really unhappy. Um, and yeah, another thing is don't run into um, an elite boss fight without proper preparation. That's important as well. If you're gonna do a crunch or anything, make sure that you have covered all your basic needs. I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm starting to hurry. Um, and also, cover the basics first because they will always um, try to catch up with you. You know, if you ignore things like, you know, sleep, food, um, doing taxes, um, you know, giving your parents a call every once in a while. In the end, you're gonna be super stressed out. I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, so yeah, basically life is chaos. Game systems are very, very focused. Um, but we can learn from it. Um, I'm sorry I can be with you today. I hope you have a wonderful time screen shake. Um, also, so I hope that nobody stopped the video. Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I wish I could be with you um, there. Um, I hope to see you next time. Thanks everyone, those were the hyper talks. Um, as soon as we have it set up, we're gonna start playing uh, Journey and then.